Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Mike Bushman. I'm the, one of the co-founders of Plum Analytics. Um, we're going to talk about uh, the product Plum X in a little more detail. I know some of you were at the uh, EBSCO luncheon where we, we talked about it for a few minutes. And now we'd like to uh, get in a little more depth, show what, what's going on with it, why, uh, and some live demonstrations as well. Um, if you have a question or you want to discuss something in a little more detail, please don't feel like you have to wait till the end. You know, let's just talk about it. Um, if it gets interactive in here, uh, that's just great. Okay. I'm usually a kinetic speaker, so you can tell we're kind of we're filming this. So I'm going to try to stay in place, but usually uh, I, I prefer to walk around. So I'm going to, I'm going to try to uh, hang onto the podium here, uh, like I don't usually. So to start with, right, the current state of scholarly measure, we're all familiar with this, right? It started in the 60s, paper-based, right? I want to publish my paper in a, a high-impact journal, and I hope future other people after me cite my work in hopefully a high-impact journal, right? And that still is the state today, right? Very, very paper-based, but we're all familiar with that. But in the meantime, you know, research has moved online, so a lot of the things that uh, we used to do, we're still doing only it's digital, right? We're saving our, our work to uh, cite it in bibliographic management systems instead of big piles on our desk, uh, th things like that. Well, what's nice about it is we can now peer into those, right? So the, what was once hidden is now available and we can kind of see, see what's going on. Uh, this is an example of how much stuff is happening on the internet that is viewable in 60 seconds, gives you an idea of the scale of what's coming up, what is available, how much of this is uh, contained in the scholarly research world, right? If there's this much stuff, 72 to hours of YouTube videos being uploaded every 60 seconds, right? How much of that are, are keynote presentations by your researchers uh, or demonstrations or clinical trial uh, videos? Right? There, there's got to be some uh, level of that as well. And right before this, what I was saying is a lot of people think, or when we first hear about uh, Plum Analytics, it's like, is that like counter? And really, it, counter is what, what is my institution using of the world's research? Shorthand. But this is more of what the world thinks of my institution's research. So kind of a different access, access point. So we've been using the impact factor, and it's basically a container-based system, right? We're using journal, uh, journals as substitutes for articles, right? And now we can hit articles as well. And when we talk about articles now, we'll go into this a little bit more, it's not even about articles anymore, right? It's about what we call artifacts, pieces of research uh, output that can be measured. Right? So not only is, are the articles going online and being digital, but researchers are using more and more different ways of getting their output out there than an article. And researchers are getting on board. I don't know if, how many of you have heard of DORA. Um, it's the uh, Declaration of Research Assessment that came out of San Francisco last year. Uh, researchers are saying, look, I'm more than my impact factor. Right? And it's not just us looking at this as a, a altmetrics from a, a librarian point of view or um, an open access publishing point of view. Uh, researchers themselves are seeing that there's more to this. And there are well-known problems with, with uh, classic citation uh, um, analysis, right? We know them, there are a lot of them, but the real point is they lag, right? By the time you publish a work, and other people in the future cite it, it can be as much as three to five years, right? So if you're saying, yeah, how was your research? It's like, well, I'll tell you in five years, right? That science is moving way too fast for that. If you published something last year, um, what's been going on in the meantime? Here's an example of an article by a, a Smithsonian researcher. He's a whale uh, researcher. Uh, this is a Nature article, right, that came out in, in 2012. And the first eight months, um, Google Scholar had found eight, eight citations. Hadn't hit Web of Science yet. Scopus had two, right? And if, if 
this were a few years ago, that's, that's what you'd be getting, right? But look at all this stuff that's also going on with it in the meantime. You can tell people have been downloading it and saving it for later. It's been get, getting a little action on Facebook, uh, et cetera. So um, if we wait for citations, it's going to take a while, but there's a lot going on in the meantime. So when we talk about alt metrics, there's a lot of, there are a lot of them, right? I'll show you some, some examples of different sources, different types of things we're, we're tracking. But to make sense of them, we use uh, categories, and this is from a paper in the Canadian uh, Association of Research Libraries of, of using cate five categories. One is usage, and I'll go into that in a little more detail, but, but classically we, we think of usage as PDF downloads, HTML downloads, and we kind of understand that, and that goes back to the counter thing. This notion of captures is, I've, I've looked at this article, and not only have I read it, but I want to save it for either myself or somebody else. Right, it's a different kind of interaction. And, this, and in a lot of ways, this is the equivalent of the big piles of, of articles on my desk. Right? When we talk about mentions, we're talking about, and I've not only read this article, but I'm commenting on it, I'm reviewing it, I'm writing an article about it. Right? It's another different kind of interaction. Social media, we put together, it's an interesting class of uh, uh, category, so it's, these are the tweets. Facebook likes, shares, uh, Google Plus Ones, and, and such. And when we first started, people would, had a notion of, well, what is a tweet worth compared to a citation, for instance, right? Are they going to be weighted? You know, is, is a tweet equal to 200th of a citation or 120th of a citation, right? And really, when we looked at it for the, you know, the last two years of seeing this, when we see tweets for articles and look at them in, in, uh, uh, in detail, almost all of them are promotional, right? And it kind of makes sense when you think about it. Uh, these are not tweets that are, you know, 140 characters or Facebook likes, shares that are saying, this article is really great because of these 17 reasons and they missed uh, something, right? They're saying, hey, check out my article. Uh, in, that just got published, or check out my buddy's article that just got published, right? And in a lot of cases, somebody may not have read it, right? So it's this very different interaction and very different from the other categories, right? So when we talk about social media that way, it's, it's how are you promoting it, should you promote it, um, and so they stand alone in that way. And then the fifth one is citations. We kind of understand that, we talked about it, but also includes things like patent citations uh, as well. To get back more into the usage, though, uh, around different artifacts, right? It's understandable for for an article, HTML views, PDF views, etc. What about a book? Can't have an HTML view for a non-ebook, right? A, a, a physical book, right? So, how do we understand how the usage is, is happening around that? So, we can tell how many libraries have held this book, right? Has my book been loaned? between libraries? Has it been checked out in libraries? Um, you can do things like sales, other things. All those are uh, identifiers of, of usage, right, for different, different artifacts. So our approach to altmetrics includes all five of these categories. Um, if you looked at what altmetrics is classically, and I love saying that because how long has it been around, but um, it really includes these bottom three, right? Citations, usage, we've, we've, we've been understanding what that is. The new thing has been the captures, mentions, and social media. But really, for us, it's really all metrics. It's, it's all of these, and we'll talk about some others that, that are even outside of this. So one way I like to, to think of it is you know, the citations, the way we've been doing it is, is this visible light part of the spectrum, right? It's what we've had for, for decades to go on, right? But the full impact spectrum is much wider. And so this gives us an idea of different ways to do it. And when that's the way we like to think about it, is we're expanding to, uh, to see the other, other side of the spectrum. So, all right, that's all well and good. How does this help me, right? 
Well, if you're performing research, you've got new data to compete for grant dollars, to get published, uh, potentially promoted, hired. Right? You can showcase the full breadth of your impact. You're not just um, held to the citations. Um, and you can do new benchmarks to determine uh, how you're doing against uh, things that matter to you. Not just about compared to the rest of the journal, for instance. If you're funding research, you have a new measure of, of the return on investment of that research. How's it, how's it doing, right? By the time uh, things get cited, the research is five, seven years old. Nobody really, you know, uh, goes back and, and checks, right? But if you can tell what we've been doing the last couple years, that's going to help you get a follow-on research uh, grant. If you like what's, what you're seeing, you're going you're gonna to give more grant dollars there. And if you're publishing research, uh, and we include I, uh, institutional repositories here. So adding value to create new metrics around the articles you're either hosting or publishing. Um, if you're looking to uh, decide you're gonna buy a new journal or recruit new authors or see how the authors you have in your journal are doing, um, it helps you that way too. So as, as librarians, we've been uh, helping the open access movement by saying, look, the institutional repository is here. We want all your research to be in there. And a lot of institutions have Im implemented man uh, mandatory archiving policies. And those have grown over the years, right? And to some degree, they're, they're successful and some they're hard to implement. But from a personal standpoint, you can see why, right? For the researchers, it's another thing somebody's making me do, right? Um, I want to do my research. It's yet another thing. It's good for society. It's good for uh, what we think, but it's another thing on my plate, administrative plate. So it's a stick, right? But it'd be better if we had carrots. So if a researcher is seeing the impact of their, of, of their research, right, in a way that says, look, you've published in an open access journal, look at all of the interaction that you're getting compared to if you're in a closed journal, for instance. And just like, you know, showing how fast you're going makes you slow down a little sometimes, sometimes. Um, you know, you can see, wow, I'm getting that, this kind of uh, uh, feedback from my open stuff. Maybe next time I'll be publishing more open, right? And my institutional repository is getting some, some traction and giving me that. I'll make sure I put it in there. So I'm getting something out of it without, uh, without too much pain. So this came out about a year ago. This is a, a chart showing uh, the competition for NIH grants. Right? The submissions continue to go up, and the success rate is down below 20%. Um, so four out of five people are not going to get that grant. So how do you... What do you use to, to help you? It's going to get more and more competitive. The more you can say, look, my research is doing, going to give you a lot more impact, that's going to help you. And here's a quote from my old boss. Um, Given how tight budgets are, we need be better measurement tools, right? And so he's, he's no longer at Microsoft. He's at the Gates Foundation. And he wants to know the things he's giving money to how are we measuring them? We need tools to do this. So with that, I'll introduce uh, uh, PlumX. PlumX was launched last year, uh, right about this time, or exactly this time, I should say. Um, it's built for scale. You know, there's a lot going on. There's, there's articles, videos, all sorts of things that are research output. So not only collecting those, but the measurements that go with them and the people. So we're, you know, estimates are around 18 million researchers worldwide and over 120 million scholarly articles alone um, are, in, are in, in the world. So creating that graph with not only that amount of data, but with the metrics that go along with them is not small. So here's how we do it. We've got artifacts up here on the left and researchers that we collect through different processes. So 
systems in place already. So if your institution is tracking uh, research or output using a CRIS system, for instance, or, or other systems that are out there, uh, we work with those to get the data out uh, and pull it, pull it into the Plum data store. On the other side of the equation, we have metrics, right, from all the scholarly data exhaust that, that, that is out there that is also going into uh, the store. And we do that by, all, you know, whether we crawl it, uh, whether there are APIs out there, we do bulk, bulk load. So I was saying, the relationships between the artifacts and each other and the people and the artifacts go in there to create the graph. And then on the other side, we have things like directories, widgets, dashboards, uh, a data API, right, that comes out that, that makes this stuff available. And I'll show you examples of those. So we talk about sources. This is a sample. Um, as I said yesterday, the, uh, we like to go A to Z, and we're almost there. Um, if we can get that Zotero API up and going, I think we'll get there. Um, but you can see this, these are a lot of different stuff going on, right? Things from, from Amazon, Dryad. If you're familiar with Dryad, it's a data set uh, repository. Uh, the Patent Office. Uh, SourceForge and GitHub are, are software uh, repositories. And then the different types of artifacts that we, uh, that we track. These are all things that we're currently tracking in, uh, in PlumX now. And you can see there's a lot of them, right? It's not just about the articles. Uh, people are using figures and, and uh, posters and uh, you know, using source code as part of their uh, as part of their research, and we need to be able to measure that as well. And that lies definitely outside the purview of the of the cited by reference tools that are out there right now. So here's an interesting example of of the new kinds of things that are coming out. This is a Born Digital Open Review book. Right, so it's being commented on as it's being written. So is that peer review? Is it a review? Because peer review is usually after it's done, right? Uh, this is happening, you know, these comments are going to be part of the book. And really, is it even a book, you know? And so how do you measure that? What are the comments there? I mean, it's really interesting new, new ways of outputting this. And these comments can become not only, uh, you know, part of the book, but can say, look, you should go on this other level of, uh, of research and could turn into its own book, right? I mentioned GitHub. It's, it's a, a software source, and I don't, can you guys see that okay? And in fact, we use GitHub for, uh, for our development. So the um, API that Plum uses, the documentation is on GitHub, and you can see it there. Um, and that, that's a classic way of, of using GitHub, right? But people are starting to use GitHub in different ways. So here is an article preprint pre in GitHub. Right? So classically, we think of GitHub as, oh, these are software metrics because it's coming from GitHub. Well, you have to expand that now, too. This, these are, you know, you'd want to have article level metrics for these things. And one of the interesting things that is uh, you know, we're, we're aware of as librarians for sure is there are many versions of an article. Right, here's the same full text article in three different places. Right, it was published on PLOS. Uh, it was deposited into PubMed Central. And it's on the University of Pittsburgh's institutional repository all in full text. Right, so if I'm the author of this, I want to know the usage of all of these together, right? Because when I talk about how many people have read my article, I want to know that total, that sum. But I also want to know which one is, is getting more, right? The differences, right? Is, is the institutional repository, um, you know, getting a lot of usage and I should make sure I'm doing that uh, next time. And we need to be able to track metrics for those different uh, versions. So here's an example where this same article has been, um, 
hit with Bitly. Do you guys know what Bitly is? It's a link shortener, right? So uh, send it around so, so we can count how many times people have clicked on that Bitly link, right? Well, one goes to the PLOS version and one goes to the DI DOI, which resolves to the PLOS version, but we need to know that those are the, those are the two different clicks uh, associated with that. And the de delicious bookmarks, 92 for the PLOS version, and two more from PubMed, right? And from the author or somebody supporting the author, you want to be able to get all these. So, uh, so we need to uh, do that as well. And we want to embed these metrics everywhere, right? Uh, not just within the product. How do you make widgets that support um, your institutional repository or a journal article um, and, or on a CV or a, a profile site? Right, you want to be able to have these things uh, available outside the product. So here's an example of a, a open, open access journal uh, that uses Plum metri metrics. So when you hit the metrics tab, you get the uh, metrics associated with that article, including their own usage stats right there. And here's an example of, uh, of a Plum widget uh, in the University of Pittsburgh's institutional repository. What's nice about this too is it's not just about the repository metrics, right? These metrics also include the published version or other versions that we're, that we're gathering. So it really adds a value to the institutional repository that we haven't had before, which has just been, this thing's been downloaded six times or 18 times. Well, we talked about those five categories, but there are other ways the other levels of impact that are happening, right? When researchers are making their stuff available in the community, how do they get credit for that? This is a welcome trust fellow uh, who does autism research, but she has a series of videos that have been uh, viewed many, many, many times by the public, right? She should, you know, that is stuff we want. We want to know that there's community impact in the, in the research she's doing and she's getting it out there to the community. So how do we give her credit uh, and give welcome credit for making this available, right? This is important stuff and, it'll, and since, till now lies outside of the classic way we do things. I'll show that in a little bit. So we measure the artifacts. We also take those and use them to measure um, researchers. But then we continue to go up the line. So how do, measuring uh, labs, departments, uh, in Smithsonian's case, museums. Uh, in journals case, case, it could be the journals and the issues themselves. So just having flexible way to group things that matter to people, right? How is my lab doing against other labs? Uh, how are my researchers doing compared to the rest of their lab? Uh, being able to, to have that available is really important. And then being able to assess and compare the impact of one article against another. I'll, I'll show some of this uh, in live uh, in just a second. Another notion that, that we found in the in the two years of doing Plum Analytics is this idea of second level metrics. So I published an article, it was read, uh, and it was interacted with classically like I've, like I've shown you. But it's also been picked up by the news, this article. So there's a BBC article, or a BBC uh, Nature article about it, there's a Guardian article about it, there's a New York Times article about it. It's really been picked up in the popular press. Well, that's good, you know, you wanna find out. But we can also measure those. So how, how much traction did that Guardian article get? Right, how much traction did that New York Times article get? Right, so we can take this ripple effect out a little bit more and go, not only was it in the New York Times, but people really read it and, and liked it, right? So you should know that about it as well. So with that, let's go ahead and see Plum X and X. Any questions while we're, we're on that? Okay, get the interactive stuff now. So everything I'm about to show you here is publicly available. 
So these are not, you know, this is, these are links you can go and check out uh, on your own as well. Um, so this is the Plumex homepage, plu.mx. When an institution or a, a publisher has a site, we, we have a dashboard for them that's their own. So for instance, the Smithsonian site is plu.mx slash Smithsonian. And this is the top level of the research output that we're tracking from uh, all the Smithsonian researchers. Uh, you can see at the top we give an, uh, a summary of the top five things we're tracking there. And as you carousel through this, we can give you a top level of the uh, usage that we're doing, the captures, and once again, these are the, these are the categories we, we introduced at the beginning. Citations from different places, the social media stuff we're tracking, right, from a whole. And this is the top level institution view. But you can narrow down, as I said, to different museums, right, or go down to the different researchers. Here is a researcher profile. Um, this is Tony Williams. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He's in the Royal Society of Chemistry, he developed ChemSpider. Uh, Tony really likes to check out uh, research profile places, and you can tell. Um, these are all the different places he has profiles uh, around the world. So um, what we can do is create links to those. So from Plum, you can get to things like the research, your homepage, or if you have other profiles, so people can easily get there. Once again, you have a summary for him. And as we scroll down, once again, here are our five, five categories, right? Because we blow this up, this table is impenetrable, right? There's so much data. Gives you an idea of, I really want to just, I'm really interested in citations versus mentions, for instance. And if you click on any of these, you get to the article, article level and can see that by itself. You can also slice and dice the metrics, right? So I, I'm not interested in all metrics. I, may, I might not care about social media, for instance. I'm really in, interested in uh, the other levels of, of activity. And you can get very granular here. So I really only care about, you know, tweets and usage, let's say, right? And once again, you can see all the different types of usage we're, we're tracking there. So now I can see this. And as I drill into it, I can then export this offline, either uh, um, in Excel or through the API, yeah. Yeah, the, the question was, can we slice it by date? So I'm only interested in the last two years, for, uh, for instance. Uh, right now, we don't limit it to that, but it, it sorts it by date. So you can get uh, that and then crunch it, but that's a great, that's a great uh, uh, thing that's not, not in there now, but would be good, a, a good one to have. But you can see their, their date ranked here, but you can't, uh, a date limiter isn't there yet. Ah. So, so I showed you MedWave uh, in action. That was on the MedWave site, right, with the widgets and the, and the, uh, uh, the tab for, for altmetrics. But they also have the dashboard available to them so they can see how the articles in their journal are doing. Now, if MedWave is a, is a mega journal, so it's just one, one journal by itself, but if, as a publisher, if they had multiple journals, you'd be able to narrow by those as well. You can narrow by section or, or, or volume within the, within the journal. But they not only can, ha can see the metrics on the site, they can go in and see how the issues and articles compare with each other. Also, like I said, the data is very uh, large, so how do we attack it, 
right? This is our, our first visualization uh, to get at this. And th the scenario here is I don't know this author, right? I don't know where to start uh, with, with his work, right? He publishes quite a bit. That's the author name itself. The first ring are the types of things we're tracking, so a lot of articles, but a lot of other different things. This next ring are the titles themselves of the artifacts. The ring out here are the sources of metrics, and then the last ring are the metrics themselves. So, for instance, Facebook, you can get shares, likes, and comments, right? So you might want to see the, the different uh, things of Facebook, but there's not a one-to-one -one correlation between sources and, uh, and the metrics they have. So PLOS, for instance, offers something like 20 different metrics, right? Uh, and so they would be viewed there as well. Well, this is everything being equal, right? All the slices are the same width. So if I change it to in the axis being impact, well, then different things pop out, right, based on that. So if I don't know Michael Pinsky's work, I may look at this article and say something's going on there. That might be the first, first article I check out for this guy. Or if I am Michael Pinsky, how is my work being done? How is my work impact against each other, right? Boy, I can't believe that article is, has gotten so much impact. I'm actually much more proud of this other article, right? But now I know. Or, yep, that's right. That's the one that, that's, that's what I consider my seminal work, and it shows it, right? So that's that scenario. And we've got some other uh, visualizations we're working on, especially uh, to get at the scenario of comparing, like I talked about, right? So how do you, uh, how do you compare your, yourself to others, uh, compare yourself to benchmarks that matter to you? Researchers, my same research age, uh, people in my department, people in my university, people in my discipline, how do I stack up? Because you get these questions of, wow, I had 600 views of that video of my keynote. And somebody says, that's great. Or is it? I mean, compared to what, right? Um, and, but you want to be able to do it what matters to you, right? I really want to see how I am with people in my discipline. Right, and say 600 is really good, or you know what, compared to other people in your lab, it's not that re not really that great, right? So, the, so, yeah. So the question is, how would you define a discipline, right? And in the same way that we have the flexible um, uh, category or the flexible. Uh, uh, ways to narrow it down when I talked about museums or issues, right? Um, also, discipline areas, and we're working with some of our early customers on which uh, ontologies to use to slice that, right? So, and it's going to be different uh, for depending on what you're interested in. And what we really like to do is have flexible ontologies that um, that match to what you're using. If you're using the the Vivo Eagle Eye ontology and that, that matters to you, great. If you're using Mesh, that's great. If you're using InSpec, um, you know that that should, that would be great too. So that those are the ideas. So thank you for letting me talk for 40 minutes. Um, does anybody have any questions of what they've seen? Um, yeah, in the back. Right. Yeah, gr a good question. It's true of all, all the sources. The, qu the question was, how do we, how do we get uh, arrangements with sources to get metrics, right? And every single one of those sources is some level of negotiation, right? Some, some are open, openly available, take it as much as you want, go, 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 here's a nice API, we don't even have to shake hands, right? To, it's a completely closed system and it may or may not cost money to get it, right? Or you're never gonna get it, right? The, and everything in between. So that's how they grow and so you know, that source list is gonna be 100 times bigger and as we go, I had a question on, on similar to that at the NISO thing on Thursday um, with um, 
you know, what, what does it take there, and, or how do you prioritize, right? Because there's a big long list we could go after, right? Our early customers help to do that, and as we start easy, big, you know, like you would expect, all those things f come into it. If we're starting to track artifacts that have different metrics that we want to get, we want to go after those first, right? So all of those things come into it and how we, how we uh, negotiate that, but yeah. So as publishers, I, I think the scenario you're thinking of, and this is, right, the open access publishers like PLOS, right? They're getting their, their data out there. Take it, it helps us, right? Uh, a, a commercial publisher, a society publisher is closed, right? When we started, we, th we thought the open access thing would be there usage-wise, and the publishers would say, uh, no, not yet, but you know, let's see some pressure. Publishers started talking to us uh, within months, and we were really surprised um, about how to do that. And a lot of them, it's, it's really a technical issue rather than a, uh, uh, a, a relationship issue. Um, they're not used to giving article level st stats to even to their authors, right? Because their buyers are libraries for the most part, right? So they give counter statistics. Um, but open access publishers, their buyers are the authors. So they've, they've got a head start. And depending on the system they're using for statistics, it's, it's easier, hard to change that or get that. But they're thinking that way for sure. So we expect that, yeah. Right. Uh, can you say it again? I want to make sure. I, I want to make sure I answer. And I was afraid I wasn't going to. Can you ask that question again? Yes. Right. Yes. Right. 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 Yeah, it's a, it, it's a good point, and I think some people will say, hey, I, uh, that's, that's not something I want to give out, right? But the opposite could be true, right? My competition is starting to do this now, and my authors are saying, why can't I, why aren't you giving this to me? You know, these guys are, and so the pressure may change on that faster, and that's really what I'm saying. I, I, I thought that was going to take a lot longer, and, I, and I'm, I'm a lot more... Uh, hopeful that it's going to be faster uh, now. And I think there are other ways. I mean, we as librarians have a lot of usage statistics on our own as well. So there, there may be other uh, ways to, to get at that. Because the usage statistics are important, let's face it. If you talk to a researcher and said, I took away your, your citations, what, el what else here matters? And it's like, I want to know how many people read my article, right? That's the next thing. So. So definitely important and something we, yeah. Any other questions? Hi, Dan. Sure. Yep. Oh, that's a really good question. Yeah, that's a really good question. So, okay, it's in there, it looks great. What, what did it take to get there, right? One of the things that's important for us is if you're tracking research at your institution and people do it from we're just starting to we have a, this solid process in place, we want to work with that, right? You don't want to start from zero. Um, so if you have a system like a Chris system or, or something else where you're tracking research, we do that. Now the University of Pittsburgh, let me show you this. is doing a really interesting thing. They're, they're tracking research through their institutional repository. And so when we set up an author, this is uh, behind the scenes, here is a query into their institutional repository for this author. So as we query the institutional repository, we pick up other articles that are being tracked there. And that's, that's the way it's, it's done in Pittsburgh. But almost every place is different. Right, and we want to work with that, but you don't want to start from zero. If you're, if you're a researcher yourself and you want to start, 
There are a couple easy ways. Are you guys familiar with ORCID? So ORCID is, an, is a researcher ID system. It's, it's really been around for about a year and a half. I think the latest numbers I saw are about four or 500,000 uh, researchers. So it's, it's starting, but it's starting to, starting to pick up. So it's a, it's a way to have a centralized place to, to track your research. And if you have an ORCID ID, you can enter it uh, right here, and we'll take the research output and do it. Or if you want to start with something like Web of Science or Scopus or uh, something else you're doing, you can save that list as a, in BibTeX format for right now and upload it to us, and it'll, it'll go right away. So those are, those are nice, easy ways to start. And things like um, one of our customers uses BPress profiles, and uh, we scrape those uh, currently. So when they add something to uh, BPress, we uh, bring it in uh, as well. So the, it's a really good question. You want to you want to make sure you're doing it with the process that that is happening to you. But once you get to this, uh, you may start with something like here are my articles, here's my scholarly articles. But really, I have a YouTube channel. I have I put all my stuff my uh, presentations on SlideShare, so I can add those. Or you know there are five articles that aren't tracked by Web of Science of mine. So here are the five DOIs. Let's add those and go. Right, so you can, you can start with a baseline of something interesting and then uh, for the people that want, they can add their, uh, their extra stuff. And you know, we add to this all the time. So, oh, you, you forgot my books, right? So here are the ISBNs or the OCLC numbers and we go right out uh, and, and call the web for that, that stuff. And once again, here's the, the GitHub for instance. So, we're constantly adding to these to try to make it as easy as possible. It's a really good question. And something we talk about with, uh, with our customers uh, all the time. So how do you track your research at your institution? Um, because we want to hook into that. Anything else? Yes? Correct. The, 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 que the question is we, we accumulate those. So, um, and also we, early on we would get this question of, of you're, you're tracking tweets and stuff and my researchers don't tweet and they don't want, and, and really, and they never use Mendeley, right? That doesn't matter, right? Other people are, are using those services and interacting with your research. So um, that happens. And it may be you that, that starts the ball rolling, right? Like I said earlier about the tweets. Hey, here's everybody, here's my article. Uh, on this, and it gets retweeted. So one of one of those tweets is yours, and then the other five are, you know, some some place in your network going out. And you want to you want to be able to track all those. Also, you want to be able to discover what happened. So if I've got six followers following my keynote on SlideShare, who are they? Right. Like so, you can go click from Plumex to the to the SlideShare site and see those, and go, wow, why were all these people in Japan interested in my research? I never knew that. I should check them out, right? There's something going on that I didn't know about. So there can be a really nice discovery element there as well. Yeah. Well, with that, thank you for your uh, attention. I really appreciate it. And uh, we're still in uh, booth 1871, way in the back. You can find us. And so those are Twitter handles. I'm Mike at PlumAnalytics.com. So you can always reach out and, uh, and find me. And like I said, we'll be in the booth as well. Um, thanks so much, everybody.